So we're now in extra time with Kashir, and we're going to be talking about uh, her career, how she got where she is today, and a little bit more about how perhaps you, the audience, can learn from her experience. So thanks for joining us in extra time. I'm so happy to be here still. Thanks. Yes. Well, um, just in, loved your uh, insights on the podcast a moment ago. I'd like to kind of continue, really, with talking a little bit about uh, some of the things you, you were discussing. Um, one of the things I think is really interesting is kind of your big break. Um, and I know we work together, so I know there's an element of that in our history. But, you know, do, do you, first of all, do you believe in luck? I'm interested in that. Do you believe in bad luck? And what was your big break in life? I'll answer the first one first uh, and then get to the second one because it's a bit longer. But the first one, I don't actually uh, believe in luck. I think that I believe in fortune in the sense of things happen outside of your control and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. Um, I think overall it all contributes to a life experience that we can't actually understand the full repercussions of. Luck for me is, is too um, unknowable. Not to say that I don't believe in it conceptually, but I just don't, I would never call it that. So I would say that some things have happened beyond my control and they've been very fortunate and then things have happened beyond my control and they've been very negative, yet both have taught me things and often the negative have taught me more than the positive. Um, when it comes to applying that and like things that have been beyond my control that have had huge repercussions in my life, my big break, I think, and which is magical that we're sitting here was because of the company that you had invested in, Foodie. And that came about, I was living in London and I w knew I wanted to be a writer and something was calling me to go back to my home country of Hong Kong. And I moved there and I had read Foodie for years and I loved the publication, had no writing experience, reached out to them, saw that they didn't have a website and they didn't really have a digital strategy, you know, on no social media presence. So I said, hey, I'm not a writer, but I feel like I can help you with this. And I've worked in food and beverage for uh, over 10 years at that point. And they gave me a chance, you know, they they brought me on and then eventually I became their digital editor. And it's just so funny how things weave together. So while I worked in that realm, I was working in media. So I met a lot of writers and I lot of, met a lot of editors of, you know, CNN and Tatler and all the kind of big publications. And I also met a lot of club and restaurant owners. And so when I stopped working at Foodie, I told our dear Helen that uh, your wife that I wasn't going to be working there anymore and then she told you and then you reached out to me and said I heard you're not working at Foodie I think that you should get in touch with another one of our founders and who's running a new project I think you'd be good for it that ended up being Meta the membership club that was very successful in its time in Hong Kong and because I worked in that membership club I met another member who at that time was bringing in an organization called Dear World, and Dear World um, decided to hire me as their kind of like Hong Kong storyteller. So they flew me to LA, they told me storytelling, which made me the public speaker that I have now become. And then I didn't even end up doing anything. Frank and I never did anything in Hong Kong for Dear World, but then when I moved to New York, um, they gave me opportunities that led to speaking at the UN and you know speaking around the world in the way that I do now was because of Meta. And what's crazy about that is that even when I was at Meta, because of the relationships I had in f and I had a lot of connections to club owners. And so when friends who were DJs wanted to come to Hong Kong, I would put them in touch with the club owners. And because I did that, that led me to meeting my business partner and best friend Yelda, who is a DJ. And I brought her. And when she came, we started doing Camel Assembly in Hong Kong. And then Camel Assembly was the company that sponsored me to move to New York. So it's just like... Wow. Great it's story. crazy intersections that you could never anticipate for. And I think that's a really important thing to know your direction, but trust the journey because you just have no idea how you're going to get there. It's a, well, it's a wonderful story and I'm proud to be a part of your um, I'm very guess, grateful. big uh, break. But I, I, I feel like you would get here regardless. And this is my counter argument or my counterpoint uh, to your your point about luck. I mean, for example, where you're born, what body you're born into, um, your uh, your gifts that you're given at birth. These are all out of your control. I'm going to call them lucky things. Mm. And I think that there's an element of what you've described there. I can tell it from the other side, which is here's this really talented person that's joined one of the startups. 
uh, I'm involved in and she's decided to leave and uh, do something else and I think we're doing another project that absolutely suits her skills and we get you involved and all the way through that process that you just described I won't repeat it but all the way through that process I'm thinking this person's positive this person's smart this person's helpful and here's my point I think it loads your luck hmm. I think luck is controllable it's you're saying luck doesn't cool. exist other than you know this random thing I, I'm actually saying the definition of luck is it's random and I'm saying the definition is wrong I don't think it's that random I think you made your own luck and I think yes I agree with I you. was lucky enough to be a part of elements that influenced it but ultimately you made it happen and you have been making it happen from the day I met you and so what I, I use you actually when I talk about luck with people and I, I use you sometimes as an example of someone that makes their own luck so wow. you got off your butt in London and you went to Hong Kong and you worked for this startup you took a risk and then when you decided to move on to something else and evolve you went and took another risk and started another worked at another startup called Meta and you continue to take risk and without risk I don't think you get luck it's actually Christine in podcast number two statement, but I believe it's so true. Mm. And I think you just continue to push the boundaries. You're aware, you're awake, and you push the limits of that. And a lot of people with your intelligence could quite easily, frankly, suppress your awareness and go mm. get a job and maybe not be that happy, but get mm. well paid and not have thirty six dollars in your bank when you go to speak at the UN. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, you know what I mean. Like you continue totally. to, you basically made your own luck. And I kind of, that's kind of my thesis around this whole. Thing is like luck is a skill I really like that actually and the reason I like it is because I don't like the idea that some people are born lucky and some people aren't even though that's very much the case I don't think that you need to carry that with you throughout your life that's true and you're I born into luck you have some luck when you're born but you can change it right I, I think I was born like I will say this I was born into immense privilege I was mm. born into perspective I think even the different cultures that exist within me the the wealth that my family had worked for like I was born into immense luck but I think I've continued that and I think that within itself allows you to continue in a certain path. You know, it's a lot, I, I, I would have had to do a lot to screw up, I think is the thing. I had a path laid out for me and I followed it and maybe I climbed a little bit higher even, but I would have really had to do something out of the ordinary to not stay on the path of fortune. And I think what's saddening and true, and I think it's, it's a, a responsibility of us to talk about it, that there are a lot of people who need to be perfect they need to have the discipline of an athlete they need to have the drive of a ceo they need to have the charm and wit of a of a presenter they need to have all of these things just to get into that lane and i think that's where we have to have more responsibility of who else we can keep bringing onto the path and having patience and graciousness and compassion for the fact that everybody's lives are different but we can create our own luck do you think if you stripped away your privilege let's call it that um it your your how your your life be different now i mean or do you think your core dna you know this kind of nurture nature thing do you think you are naturally the way you are now which is very aware or do you think your upbringing has allowed you to get to the point where you're aware now yeah i actually wrote on one of my last year's essay in university in my last year of university one of my essays was around nature versus nurture um and i the the thesis the conclusion which most psychologists come to um is that it's 50-50. I think that there is there is an essence to people that is, um, if you would tap into it, you can't suppress it, you know, it exists. Um, I think that there are a lot of factors along the journey that enable you to be able to fully live in that. And I think another element to this is that their society has a lot of pre-approved scripts and I think that we push those pre-approved scripts because it maintains a certain power order. And I think what's starting to happen is those are starting to shift because we're realizing there's many different ways to do life. And um, I think I would be very much, like I don't think I've changed drastically, but I do recognize where, you know, and I'm not saying, I think privilege is sometimes a very bad thing. I think it's an, I think it creates a certain amount of selfishness, entitlement, it numbs you. Um, so I think that there's there are certain things that are not good about it. And I see, for me, particularly, say, as a privileged biracial person who was kind of born as an immigrant and constantly felt as an immigrant in many places, though a very privileged immigrant, identity is something I'm very confused by. And, like, I don't know myself as well as somebody who was born perhaps, um, you know, very 
very cultured. And I say this about my business partner, Yelda, who is very Afghan um, and experienced a lot of pain because of that from, from religiosity to, um, you know, how she, she was controlled. And she speaks about this a lot in terms of the expectations that were had on her. But she knows herself very clearly. And I think I, I crave that kind of certainty. So I think that there's, a, there's different there's different ways that it manifests but i think that the most important thing we remember is that we control it and we have the ability to control it thank you for joining extra time i think our time is up i could literally talk to you for the next 24 hours and still not have enough Same. of your amazing insights so thank you so much for your time appreciate it and thank uh, you we'll so see you in new york me. i can't wait i look forward to your podcast don't forget folks new podcast coming March come on 8th. assembly radio march 8th download it tune in i'll send you the link as soon as it goes live so everyone here can know about it but thank you thank you simon